welcome to episode 18 of the Breaking Bio podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Hamble from the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. Today is Thursday, February 14th, Valentine's Day. Yay! So... <laughs> It's getting all romantic up in here, I don't know what I'm saying. You know. Oh yeah, yeah there's nothing more romantic than all that talk about eating bugs and fish and stuff. So. <laughs> we're going to slow it down a little and you know, get to the slow dance. And, um, although I, I hear you rap, so we'll get to that later. Oh, yeah. But uh, So today uh, I have a smaller than normal stable of co-hosts, starting off with Morgan. Hey, Morgan Jackson, PhD student at the University of Guelph in Canada. And ending with Morgan. And we're joined by a special guest today. We have Tommy Lowe with us. And Hi, uh, I'm a lecturer in parasitology and evolution biology at University of New England, Australia. People get confused. They go, oh, no, you, no, 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 not that one. It's the one that's <laughs> out in the middle of nowhere in Australia. So. <laughs> Actually, I'm not going to lie. I had to look up where you were, too. I, oh, so did I. When I... <laughs> I'm like, let me see. I, don't mind this going on. I, I still actually only have a vague idea of where you actually live. Like it's, yeah, it's a, it's a town of like about 25,000 people. It's a very unusual place because it's like a university town, but it's only got 25,000 people. And it's kind of in this very um, rural kind of Australia. So I think latitudinal-wise, it's in between Brisbane and Sydney, and a little bit inland from Coffs Harbour. So if you want to kind of triangulate where we are, that's that's where we are. So Let's get into some of the science. So you, you're a parasitologist. Yes, I am. And an evolutionary biologist. Yeah. So I, well, I got into parasitology not from the traditional parasitology route, so most people who get into parasitology would have started from, say, either medical or a microbiology. Well, not, not so much microbiology, a microscopy background. I don't think even that's a thing anymore where you know, they're interested in small things. And I, know, I still know some kind of uh, parasitologists from probably around about my kind of peer group, like my age or my stage of career, who start off from a background of like describing parasites and doing these taxonomic drawings and stuff like that. Whereas I got into it from a more of an evolutionary biology background. The reason I got into parasitology was I read uh, Carl Zimmer's book, Parasite Rex. So you can mm. thank him for being where I am now. And so I, I read his book and it was right about in second year or third year. And you know, back then I was thinking about honors, doing like some kind of uh, research project. This is a thing that we have, I think, in Australia and maybe Canada. I'm not sure whether other parts of the world they have masters instead of having honors. So I was thinking about doing honors project and I read his book and I go, wow. I knew I wanted to do some kind of biology research, but it was when I read his book, I go, wow, parasites are whack. They're crazy. I need to get myself into some of this action. They're awesome. And so I eventually, you know, emailed around looking for people and eventually came across this guy called uh, Robert Pullen in New Zealand. And so it was in the course of writing this kind of a review essay about host manipulation by parasite, which is a very sexy kind of a topic, that I, uh, I, I noticed his name pop up a lot. And I go, hang on, this guy looks like what he's not, he knows what he's talking about. And then I went to his website. Uh, well, actually, no, he didn't have a website back then. I just looked up his uh, reference list. And I found out he publishes like 20 something papers a year. And I go, whoa, this guy looks like he knows what he's talking about. I'm going to do an honors project with him. And looking back now, I think um, because I did, because I, I, I asked other people about like how they got into the PhD and all that kind of thing. You go, oh, well, we have to go for an interview and blah, 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 and stuff like that. I basically just turned up to his office at the end of my honors project and go, hey, I want to do a PhD in this stuff, you know? And then the next day, he just hand me the piece of paper with all these <laughs> ideas on it. And then, you know, just go take it from there. And I thought like, wow, I didn't have to go through all that stuff. But then on hindsight, I think the honors project and all of that thing that went on throughout that year, it was like as if it was like an extended interview. 
So mm. we got a feeling for, okay, how he works and he got a feeling for how I work and he was okay with me and I was okay with him. And so that's why I ended up doing my PhD and then, you know, wow, after all that, and then next thing you know, I'm here. So that's how I got into Parasite. I read Parasite Rex and I go, Parasite's are awesome. And everything that I know about Parasite was self-taught afterwards because I never did anything to do with Parasites when I was an undergrad. I did a degree, um, Bachelor of, it was like Bachelor of Science in Environmental Biology at University of Technology, Sydney. And they might have mentioned parasites in passing. They might have said, oh, yeah, there are these things, they're parasites, they're living things, let's move on. And so I never learned anything about them. And then I found out how awesome they are. And I just kind of decided that, oh, wow, I'm going to read all the things about parasites. <laughs> and so that's what I've been doing ever since. And that's the reason why I keep the blog. It's because it's like, it's basically just me cathartically telling people about awesome shit that I've been reading from the literature. So that's how I ended up where I am now. I just go, parasites are awesome every time I see someone. Hey, that's dude, awesome. I'm, I'm working in viral evolution and I started in psychology. So mm. I'm familiar with, you know, sidling into a topic. Yeah. Um, actually, I'm, I'm super stoked that you're on because, you know, frankly, it's nice to talk to somebody who doesn't just do bugs. But, uh, <laughs> but no, I've, Host, uh, host manipulation by parasites is an incredibly fascinating area. Yeah. Um, I've been doing I a lot of reading on yeah. viral manipulations. Of oh, hosts. yeah. And, I've uh, been reading uh, a bit about that, too. Uh, I've been preparing some stuff for uh, my parasitology course, which is starting in about two weeks. And I'm going to be using some example about host man manipulation from actually the viral world, especially in relation to how certain viruses, especially plant viruses, manipulate both the plant and the insect to help them help better vector them to other plants. So one of the most interesting example I remember reading was it was about some kind of, um, I think some kind of cucumber virus or something like that. And what this virus does is that it does this uh, kind of a bait and switch trick. So it, it, when, when it infects the plant, it changes the volatile that is released by the plant. So it attracts aphids onto there. So the so to the aphid, it smells really, really good. Now the thing about this virus is that it's one of those viruses that once it gets picked up by a vector, it must be transmitted to another plant within a few minutes or a few hours. Otherwise the virus would uh, die or expire. So that it needs an aphid to bite the plant and then immediately, almost immediately leaves and then goes somewhere else to infect another plant. So it does this bait and switch thing where it makes the plant, the host plant, smells really, really nice. But then when the aphid bites into it, it's like, oh god, this is disgusting. What the hell? And so it, it flies away and go and like bite some other plant which isn't infected, and then the virus get passed on. I thought like that was a really clever trick. I would kind of describe it like it's almost like as if you know we walk past that shop, uh, lush. I'm not sponsored by yeah. lush, by the way. I just put that. <laughs> um, Anyway, you walk past and go, wow, that smells really, really nice. But imagine if you pick up one of the product and bite into it, you're going to get the same reaction. So basically, <laughs> aphids have, like, you know, get tricked into this kind of bait and switch thing where they become this vector for a virus that needs to go from one plant to another within a very short space of time once it gets onto the aphid. So um, I think that was a PNAS paper that was published in 2009. Uh, I guess you can include it into the show note. I can send it to you. <laughs> But um, there's many more and more examples of this coming out, and I, I think that, like, for a while, I think the research in relation to host manipulation, thought, kind of, it went down a bit, but then it picked up again as new people kind of picked up on it, and then looked, investigated in systems other than just the usual kind of worm in the brain thing, because mm -hmm. uh, I remember in the middle of my PhD, I had a conversation with uh, Robert Pullen about how I said, is it just me or are there more review papers on host manipulation than actual paper on host manipulation? Because I think sometime during about 2005 and 2007, that was a really sexy topic and everyone wants to do a review about like all the potential things I could, it's like, can, can you guys actually do something with this idea rather than just like, this is really, really cool because I think research relating to host manipulation initially started in 2007, no, no, not 2007, 1970s. 
and then it kind of picked up and reached kind of a plateau, and then it got to about the late 90s, and then people were like, look at all these examples. Let's talk about these examples. And, then it went there. and then now it's picking back up again, which is good to see. So you write the blog, and you, you talk about all kinds of parasites, and you have you know, all these cool things. So what's your favorite? What, uh, what parasite really gets up in you? It's really hard to say. I would compare it, and this is this is gonna be this is gonna sound really bad, because um, you know parents are gonna hate this. It, it'll be like saying your favorite child. Mm. I don't think parents appreciate like going. Hang on a second. Are you comparing our child <laughs> children <laughs> to a leech? Parasites. <laughs> I'm not sure the parasites would appreciate that anymore. I think. Whoa. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> It's like a child is a fail parasite. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, that's gonna go in the sound bite. A child being a fail oh, yeah. parasite. So yeah, um, that's, that's gonna be our new tagline on the website. A child is a fail <laughs> parasite. <laughs> Excellent. I'll put that all over my website as well. It's yeah. gonna alienate a lot of people. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, uh, it's it's really hard to say. It really depends on. Um, like what I happen to remember. So I remember there was, uh, for some reason, I just thought of fruit. I don't know what what I was thinking that, but I thought of fruit, and I got I thought of two examples that are re in relation to fruit. So one of them is a nematode worm that alters um, the behavior and appearances of ants. So this nematode needs to get into birds, but its intermediate host in the life cycle is an ant. So in order for it to complete its life cycle, it needs the bird to eat the ant. Now, you will think that's pretty straightforward. You know, birds eat insects naturally, and sometimes they eat ants. But then, um, oh, yeah, I noticed, um, well, well, I don't know whether this is the same parasite, because this is the parasite that turns the ant into a berry. So it, um, so it makes the abdomen, or the gaster, technically speaking, all bright and red, and the ant actually start acting like a berry. It doesn't crawl around, it just sticks around near a branch somewhere and then it kind of sticks its abdomen in the air, kind of wave it around, going, I'm a fruit, I'm a fruit, <laughs> eat me. And so I thought that was really, really crazy. But then I also wrote this other blog post about a wasp that um, it, it's actually, I guess some people call it a seed predator. I would say it's a seed parasite. Uh, it infects these berries, and these berries are normally eaten by birds. Now, the wasp face an opposite problem where it doesn't want the bird to eat the berry. So what it does is that the larva actually secretes something that causes the berry to stay green. So even the berry would normally, like, it turns red as it ripens, it would stay green. And in fact, they do, the, the, the larva somehow does something to the fruit. So that it's when they look at the, the the color tone of it, it's actually greener than normal like unripened berries. So I thought like those are two that I wouldn't call them favorites, but things that immediately come to mind. Go oh, wow, that is really really cool. But then you know, this stuff like you know shark tapeworm that uses dolphins as intermediate hosts, which people don't really think about. Hang on a sec. Dolphins, flipper, flipper can just be like an intermediate host, and that's I think that's the kind of the um, the insult behind that, which is like flipper isn't even the last host for this parasite. It's like that internet <laughs> meme phase, you know. You'll find this parasite in a flipper in 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 the dolphin, and then it'll be like, this is not even my final form. <laughs> it needs to be eaten by a great white shark, and then it can go into its final form. So. That's awesome. <laughs> the evolution of complex life cycles and parasites is rather astounding. Like, yeah, that, you know, how does well, how does some of these life cycles come about in the first place? How do you I'm get actually, from that? This is it's great that you brought this up because I'm actually going to be giving a, a lecture about this. So um, this is like kind of good practice. But I think the, the reason for the evolution of complicated life cycle, uh, first of all, it's really hard to determine the evolution of parasites simply because unlike, say, vertebrate animals, they don't leave a very good fossil record. In fact, they live an absolutely appalling fossil record because they're tiny, soft little organisms that they don't fossilize well. Try to with viruses sometime. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, isn't there now the whole feel of like, paleo virology that I hear about how they could 
look at like the gene, like they look at retroviruses that embed mm -hmm. themselves into the genome of the host. So, but I guess that's a separate conversation there. Um, but but with with these uh, parasites, I, I guess there's kind of two push and pull, uh, pull and push in relation to the evolution of complicated life cycle. So the ancestral parasite would have only infected one host because you know you can't have a parasite that all of a sudden just spring out of nowhere and infect two hosts in its life cycle. So it might have started out with only infecting one host, but then the host is also a prey organism for a predator. So it will be advantageous for the parasite to somehow to be able to, uh, in case that is uh, prey is normal host, the prey gets eaten by a predator to be able to survive in the in the predator as well. And this actually happens in some living species. So these uh, acanthocephalans, thorny-headed worm, they sometimes do these, this thing called a post-cyclic transmission where they would infect the fish host as the normal kind of final host. But then, say, a larger fish comes along and eat it. And then, you know, the the its normal host is killed, but then it can come out of the normal host and in turn infect the gut of the predator that ate its original host. So this gives you kind of an insight into like how it might have occurred. Of course, this is a hypothesis. We don't really at the moment have any way to prove it or have any like further evidence of it. But this is a living example of how some parasites might be able to do it. Another where, reason, yeah, go on. Sorry, I was just thinking that would imply that complex life cycles would be more, in parasites would be more likely to evolve in systems where the initial host is, suffers from high predation rates. As yeah. opposed to low. Yeah. Well, I wonder if we, we could do okay. some sort of like experimental evolution on that. You know. Possibly. It's just that some of the parasites that have these complicated life cycle. They have relatively long generational time, comparing mm. with say, you know, organisms that are normally used for these generational studies like Drosophila or bacteria. So it will take you <laughs> thousands of years to do experiments like these. Uh, however, it's a great grant you're going to write there. <laughs> oh yeah, no. <laughs> Start uh, wearing flipper now. Uh, actually, it's funny, you know, you talk about like predation rates and stuff like that. A lot of the parasites that have complex life cycles, you notice that some of the intermediate hosts, which is where the larval parasites are, they are often prey animals. So you have uh, shrimps, you have little fish, you have tadpoles and stuff like that. So basically, they're things that are likely to be eaten by um, larger things, which are usually the final host for the, the adult stage of the parasite. So there could be something to, um, you know, the idea that predation might have driven the evolution of these complex life cycle. You don't uh, see a lot of them starting off in apex predators, huh? Well, I don't know. I mean, that's a, that's an interesting question. And um, I don't know whether that's a question that we could even answer at this stage. Uh, there was a paper last week that got me kind of excited because it combines my two love, which is uh, fossils and parasites. And I thought those are two things that, like, don't, for reasons I already talked about, don't really come together very often. But there was a research group that found some tapeworm eggs in coprolites of sharks. And I got really excited about that. It's like, wow. And when you look at the eggs, they look very much like the eggs of tapeworm eggs today. So it indicates that by the Permian period, which was where this kind of shark poop was stayed back from, the tapeworm was already so evolved to a stage where they resemble the tapeworms of today. So this means that the fossil, like the potential fossil record, or at least how long parasites or parasites like tapeworm have existed, they've been around for a very, very long time. So they've been a very integral part of life on this planet. And I think it will be um, to overlook parasites, to not consider parasites in studies of any biological system would be a, a great oversight because you're basically ignoring like the big kind of what's underneath the tip of the iceberg. Well, you're preaching to the choir there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually interesting. The the uh, the worms in this case. Do they have any uh, like? Uh, come on, brain. I'm so tired. Of that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I was, I was thinking, have they done any molecular work looking at you know, the the history of these? I 
I think they I think they have. Like there's actually a lot of co-evolutionary study. Well, there has actually been a substantial amount of molecular work done on the phylogeny of these different worms. Substantial for parasitology, not substantial comparing with other groups which are more um, accessible. But I understand that it has been done, but often you get different results depending on what yeah. genes you look at. Um, and I guess the other thing is that you, it's really difficult or impossible to have a molecular clock for these things. Yeah. And so, uh, although um, from what we know now, there is kind of a, and this is going to be going into one of my lectures as well, there is a very tight knit kind of co-evolutionary relationship between sharks and tapeworms, even though there has been a few host switching um, events that occur over the course of their evolution. I wonder the reason why sharks and tapeworms have such a tight co-evolutionary relationship is because sharks and other elasmobranchs, so sharks raise skates, in the intestine they have a spiral valve structure in the intestine and the tapeworms often have these scoluses which are kind of, they, they're very extravagant, they, they fit right into the folds of the intestine and it's amazing you have like they, some of them looks like flowers. They have like these elaborate petals and they vary a lot between different species. And that's why a particular group called the Tetraphyllidian, which I understand now has been shown to be paraphyletic. So they don't all have a common ancestor, but these particular tapeworms that have uh, sharks as definitive hosts, they're very species specific because they're scoluses, which are the attachment structure. Uh, have evolved in such a way so that they only fit into the fold of a particular species of host. So from those species of tapeworms, you have, uh, you, you can, they're, they're very species and you can tell a very kind of neat co-evolutionary story between the parasite and the host, even though there's a few messy kind of host switches every now and then between them. Um, so quickly because we are we're starting to run out of time here but uh, you you're a big proponent of science art and, and you know communicating science through drawing and, and, and various ways so how did you get uh, involved with the, the artistic side of science uh, I think like throughout my PhD I was like drawing various things I like to draw a little uh, these very I guess dinosaur comic is to be familiar with dinosaur comic Mm. Yeah, I, I discovered Dinosaur Comic about halfway through my PhD and then I started drawing these little um, comics that I started calling uh, existential confectionaries because I got into a conversation with my friend that somehow we came up with this thing called Solipsis Candy. It's a very, di like, it's one of those you have to be there moment. We somehow came up with a brand of candy that is so awesome that it makes you question, like, the existence of the universe. So we called it Solipsis. <laughs> anyway, I went off on there for some reason, and then I started calling this little series called Existential Confectionaries. And they have, and like, I, I can send you to link to it afterwards, but they're just these like random little observation and non sequitur that I started drawing. But then I was always really into drawing like other things as well. So I started drawing kind of other topics. I started drawing this thing called the Eschaton D3, which is another crazy thing altogether. And so science, or at least illustration based on science concept and ideas for maybe a quarter or fifth of what we what I actually draw about. But I think that every time I draw something like that, especially the more conceptual ones, it helps put my brain into a different gear. And I start thinking about things in a different way. And so uh, once I got onto the interwebs, one of the first science art people that I started communicating with was Glendon Mello. And so he suggested I put my art up somewhere and I'm putting it up on DeviantArt. And then, you know, and then I got into this whole social media thing. And that's, I guess that's how I ended up, like I've always been like a really artsy, sciencey kind of person. And I don't really see what some people see, which is these two dichotomy between these two very different things. They might carry the work out in very different ways because they have very different objectives. But I see a lot of parallels between the way that scientists works and uh, artists works as well in terms of coming up with ideas and trying to come up with ways to execute a particular ideas as well. So I don't really see a dichotomy. I see kind of two parallels 
that they're looking to achieve different things. Well, we're just about out of time here, but we, uh, so Bug Girl tells us, and actually rather informed us, oh. that uh, that you're, I don't know, a, a budding rap artist here? Uh, well, it, it, it's funny. In 2009, I came across this guy called Bubba Brinkman, which I guess he's now famous now because he's been on Science Online, and everyone was like, <laughs> oh, Bubba Brinkman. And, uh, I had a very <laughs> hipster moment where I went, <laughs> I was into it way before, <laughs> so it's like, oh, wait a minute, you're being a hipster, Tommy. So I actually have a, um, I actually have a DVD from him, which is the, and this is going to make all the science online people so jelly, uh, the rap guy to evolution. Uh, but anyway, I heard his stuff, and I go, oh, wow, this is an actual, like, it, not only, because I, I noticed that music in science previously has sometimes been very gimmicky or misrepresented. So I was like, so this is the first time where, as he described it, um, the first peer review rap album, even though there's a bit of evolutionary psychology stuff, which I thought like, mm, I'm a bit iffy about that. But anyway, I really like the whole package, like, or at least the idea behind it. So when I first heard it, I was like, oh, wow, hip hop and science, oh, okay. And I thought about this, it was like, hang on, I'm gonna give this a go. And so I started thinking about it, and in the first year, and see, this is the first year I got my lectureship, I go, you know what, I'm going to experiment a little bit. And I started writing a rap about kin selection and evolution of cooperation, and just to see if I could do it. And then I did it, and then I was like, huh, I wonder what I can actually, like, perform it kind of in just in my own room, I guess. And then I go, oh, yeah, I can actually do this rap. The rap flows really well. I wonder whether I can memorize it. So it was just a whole series of, like, up the ante, where there's, like, a part of my brain who just keep gloating, you know, and going, come on, go on, go on. <laughs> eventually, it culminated in me performing it at the end of a, um, a lecture of the same thing. So I give a lecture in second year evolution about kin selection in the evolution of cooperation. And so I go... You know what? I, I'm fuck it. I'm, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it because what's the use of writing this rap if you can't actually <laughs> perform it? You know. So exactly. uh, so so that that's what I end up doing. So it was. It's called uh, Word Up Altruism, and I guess you guys want me to uh, give it a go. Now I'd love to hear it. Okay. If we can, totally if we can get a little soundbite from MC Parasite, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So this is Word Up Altruism. Yo, you best step up and listen, cause this be the word on altruism. It ain't no challenge to natural selection to be based on blood and your reputation. A costly act which benefits the group is costly to you, but you get to recoup, cause everyone in the group are altruistic. What goes around comes around, so say statistics. Well, when cheaters invade, yo, things get intense. Cheaters living large at everyone's expense. To all that's left but those who cheat as genes, no more co-op cause they be lean and mean. Nice groups and last you to cheat an invasion, so out the window goes group selection. Yo, you best step up and listen, cause this be the word on altruism. Yo, just there be many ways to live in the sea, there be many different ways to live altruistically. So whether they're based on cred like vampire bats, or it be you social like the naked mole rats, the small to evolution and just competition, there be plenty of room, yo, for cooperation. Yo, word up, altruist. Wow. That was amazing. That was epic. <laughs> All right. <laughs> wow. Well uh, done. So tell me you're going into the studio. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I feel like I have to like write up another few repertoire. I've got like a few kind of in the works. There's one called um, like I always like Jay Z's 99 Problems, so I made a few <laughs> variations on that. And one of them, the most current one that I've written, is actually on social media and science. It was like 99 problems but my blog ain't one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I can't wait. You're gonna have to come back and de debut that one for us. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No. yeah, you guys can have like an exclusive or something. Awesome. All right. Well, I think we can wrap it up there because I can't think of anything better to go with. So nope. thank you for joining us for episode 18 of the Breaking Bob Podcast and we'll see you guys next time.